Let's take time to pray for a moment as we prepare for the session this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this week, for things that we've learned, for ways we've been challenged, for new thoughts that we have wrestled with, and for the confidence that you are here in our midst, guiding, guiding us with your wisdom, guiding us by your spirit who dwells within us. We thank you that we are part of your church. And as we think about culture, we realize that, that we are your church, sent into this world. And so we pray that you guide us that in, our, in our thoughts, in the desires of our hearts, in our actions, in our words, we would bring honor to you. Thank you for this, this event each year that brings us together, that you might lead us together, equip us. We pray in Jesus' name. This morning we're going to think about secular culture for a, a, a fairly brief while, actually. I'm going to talk to you just for a few minutes, and then John Campbell is going to come and share with you uh, considerably more as we think about secular culture. So I just want to introduce our thinking about secular culture because I think sometimes people in our churches and perhaps pastors as well really are confused, I guess, about what is really happening and happening so rapidly in our society. Um, when I teach sociology of religion, which I have done occasionally, it always amazes students to look at sort of demographic changes that have taken place over not that long period of time. But, but after the Second World War in Canada, on an average Sunday, about 70 to 75 percent of Canadians were in a church. Now, to give you some perspective, at the same time in the United States, about 40% of Americans were in church on an average Sunday after the Second World War. So almost double the percentage of Canadians in church after the Second World War. Today, on an average Sunday in the United States, about 40% of Americans are in church. And somewhere around 20% of Canadians are in church. So while in the United States there have been little ups and downs uh, it's been fairly steady. In Canada, it's gone from somewhere in the 73, 75% range down to about 20% of people. So that's a huge change that makes this topic noticeable, but still not very understandable. So we live in an increasingly secular culture, and we're unsure of how to relate to secular people. It's very difficult for us to understand that culture because we don't participate in it in many cases. Many times people in our churches have a pretty insular network. They, their friends are church people. The people that they, they have in their homes, they're people that are pretty familiar with the church culture also. So we often don't participate in it very much, and we don't understand it. Increasing numbers of Canadians live very secular lives in a culture that most Christians would consider quite foreign. It's difficult to engage with secular culture or to cross cultures effectively when many people in the church do not realize the extent of secularization. I was a member one time an adult class in our church, and I and I, I said to people, can you just in some quick phrases or words tell me what you think your secular neighbors' lives are like? And so these good Christian folks started responding. They say, sad, depressed discouraged, without hope. And, you know, I just said to them, look, they look at us and feel sorry for us. You know, we had to get up early to come to church Sunday morning. They're having a whale of a time. We don't understand. We think that somehow the rest of the world sees through the same lens that we do as they look at their lives, and that's not the case. And part of, I think, the problem is that when we think of secularization, we think of it quantitatively. In other words, we look around and we say, there aren't as many people in church as there used to be. Or we say, 
Why do all the hockey games have to be on Sunday mornings? <laughs> or we said, they didn't even know the Ten Commandments. Or we said, can you believe what they said on TV about Christians? And so it's sort of a how many and how much is how we see secularization. And it is true that there are changes in those areas in our society, but outward evidences of a more secular Canada, this is the result of secularization. That's not what secularization is. Secularism is a much deeper phenomenon. So it's really embedded in, in what as a sociologist I would call qualitative changes that are taking place. We see evidence of that in other ways. But it's the things that are happening that are not countable that really matter. We really need to understand. There's a shift from finding meaning in outward sources. So looking outward to God or to the church or to some religious teaching, to the scriptures, to a search within oneself for meaning. So people today say, well, I'm still a very spiritual person because they know I mean, there are still spiritual needs in their lives, but they're looking inwardly to find those answers. And uh, Charles Taylor uh, speaks much more extensively about this uh, than I am going to in this moment this morning. The second thing is that people have a voice in a way that wasn't true with regard to, uh, well, again, broadly speaking, religious matters, I'll say. In other words, it used to be that the voices in our society that talked about God, life after death, spiritual issues. They were seminary trained voices, mostly. Today, anybody can upload anything onto a blog, onto a website, they can respond to the CBC News. I mean, people respond, and that has given secular voices platforms and some of those voices are very loud and sometimes they're very critical. Doesn't mean that it's a lot of people, but sometimes those voices are very critical. Everyone is a religious expert online. In fact, sometimes the people with less training seem to be more the expert online. The meaning of community has changed in our society. And that affects them too because the church was an institution institutions and community don't really go together anymore. That's a big change in our society. People live normal lives without reference to God or to the church in ways that were impossible during the 20th century. I mean, the church is just not in people's faces in the way that was true for a long time. So most young adults, though secular in their thinking, they believe in God still. Christian Smith, in, in his writing, he talks about a moralistic, therapeutic deism. He says that's the real religion of young adults today. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. These are, are young adults who grew up without church. They're quite different from baby boomers who dropped out of church, but many times we who are baby boomers don't realize that. So they are curious, but they're, they're not people who dropped out of church. They really don't have church in their background. Baby boomers are secular more in the old-fashioned sense. Although, don't tell baby boomers they're old-fashioned about anything. But they are. We are. They choose to prior prioritize other things ahead of God and church. That is not the case with younger secular adults. They are still seekers. But not as many as there used to be. A few young adults are seekers. They are secular in their thinking. And I'll finally say, some sociologists, and I agree with this, believe that secularization is in some way primarily the result of changes in the church, not changes in the society. As we, as we stop engaging the society, we lost our influence. We'll stop there and uh, let John continue. Speak your comment about how technology allows uh, so many people to have a loud voice. Uh, sometimes they're dissenting. To that I say, amen. Because it gives us an opportunity like never before to engage people in conversations they may never have felt free to ask. And at the same time, yes, there isn't the uh, educated voice presence as it needs to be in digital media. Uh, and shame on me. And shame on us because we're quite capable 
of doing that. And I'm also glad that's why we're live streaming symptom lectures and have had hundreds of people join us via the live stream and YouTube channels. Uh, because in that culture, we can't participate even in the digital. So first of all, uh, just as we kind of dive into a little bit of secular culture, to understand a, a little bit more about what that is, what that looks like, what's driving it, and, but also the end goal here is really to, uh, for us to see how can we engage it. I'm going to set my timer here so we all don't miss chapel afterwards. Here we go. Um, I'm really going to co cover this in three ways. First is just understanding culture a little bit, and I want this to be kind of an interactive thing with you, so I'm going to ask questions, and I actually expect result uh, responses, so just to put that out there for the minute. Um, the second thing I was going to talk about relating is, is hard in, in culture. Uh, maybe not as hard as we think, but it is hard, and I want to look at some of the reasons why that we sometimes, as churches, have and find barriers to this. And then the third part is uh, my nice, uh, soft way of saying, uh, do it anyway. And we'll look at, uh, hopefully, some practical ways this afternoon. Uh, Garth Williams and Cheryl Ann uh, Beals is going to help us facilitate a discussion about this, and during that time, there'll be an opportunity for us to share with each other things that we have tried as congregations, as individuals, uh, not that we can steal each other's programs or that kind of thing and try to shoehorn it into our own communities, but to learn some basic principles from each other about how and uh, what ways we should go about doing this. So let me start here with uh, just understanding culture. Very briefly, what is culture? There's a whole lot of different definitions about this, but uh, this is one that I, I kind of liked. It says, this culture consists of beliefs, behaviors, objects, and other characteristics common to members of a particular group or society. Through culture, people, groups, define themselves, conform to societal shared values, and contribute to society. Thus, culture includes many social aspects like language, customs, values, norms, morals, rules, tools, technology, products, organizations, institutions. All of that comes together to help us form our culture. And I wanted to push out a little bit on this, because sometimes when we talk about secular culture, we get very kind of focused on morals. And we, 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 we there, we start having this conversation about how do we engage and should we engage in this culture and that culture. And, and really what we're talking about is just beliefs or morals that are there. But we need to step back and realize that culture encompasses a lot more of the things. And there's a lot more room for engagement in a lot of these other areas for the church and to understand secular culture. So, before we kind of move into this, one of the things I always want to put up front and kind of wrestle with for a second is the question of why is it important to engage culture? Why can we not just have the culture within our church and say, this is good enough, and say, let culture out in society go whichever way it is, and it's not our responsibility to do that. I'm a firm believer that we as a people are called to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the entire world, that it's God's desire to see all be reconciled to him. As ambassadors of Christ, I believe it is our responsibility to go to all nations to preach the gospel. Amen. And that cannot be accomplished without going and engaging culture. I'm a big fan for churches to try to enter into and speak into cultures that are not our own so that people there see that the gospel is for them. That it's not a traditional white European religion that only matters for people that look like me, but that the gospel transcends all cultures and speaks into all of them, and all cultures are under judgment of the gospel. And to make the gospel understandable for the people. I mean, if you were at the prayer breakfast this morning with Mark Reese, who talked about and read the passage from Acts, where it talked about Paul pointing to the idol of the unknown God. To be able to speak into the culture and say, here it is. Let me tell you about it. You've been looking for it. You've been afraid that you've missed it, and you have. Let me tell you about it. Those points of opportunity when we engage cultures to show the gospel are great. But when we talk about secular culture, and just think about your community, wherever you come from today, Right now, I live in Kentville, Nova Scotia. Sometimes when I think about church things, I also reflect on my hometown where my parents live in McAdam, New Brunswick. I lived in St. John's, Newfoundland, and Halifax, and really all over Atlantic Canada and a little bit beyond. And each one of those areas, each one of our towns has a unique culture. And I don't care if you're as close to between each other as New Minus and Kentville, the culture is different. 
But when we think about the culture and the community, we have to be careful not just to talk about the culture out there. Because there is not one culture out there. We can talk loosely about a Canadian culture, which is a loose framework of shared values and systems <coughs> and geography. And, you know, it's, there is kind of an overarching umbrella, but I've never heard anybody really be able to define what Canadian culture is. We, at best, can define what it isn't. So even in your community, even whatever small town that you might be in or from whatever city, there are many cultures that exist there. Now, I'm not just talking about multi-ethnic cultures, and we're going to talk about that later today, so I'm not going to go there because that opens up a whole other area. But I'm even talking about maybe in your community, which is predominantly maybe white European descent, that everybody might look like you, everybody else. Even in that case, there are many cultures. There are many subcultures. And our church is one of many there. The, one of the things we'll get to do um, this afternoon is to sit down and really identify some of those cultures that might exist within your community. To think about which ones are we already connecting with, which ones are we not, which ones can we even identify. We're pretty good as Baptists, quite honestly, of identifying youth culture and various aspects of youth, youth culture. We've done great work in that area for a number of years. But we're not quite as focused maybe on some of the other areas of cultures with young adults or adults uh, in our communities. One of my favorite ones to pick on when I'm teasing my father and we're having late night conversations of theology and church and all fun things over the, over the internet uh, is I keep pushing them saying, you know what your church should do, Dad? You really should minister to the four wheel of culture. It's huge in McAdam. I mean, McAdam only has like 1,200 people and many earthquakes. If you've been following the news, I think they had 20 this week. Um, yeah, very strange. Uh, but there's a huge four wheel of culture. The guys love going out and being in the woods. And, and I'm like, that is a culture. It's a culture of set values. They have a system that they do. They have a combined hobby. There's a language. There's an understanding. There's a, a way that you're supposed to uh, operate and, and, and be in that. And the church should be there. And he rolls his eyes at me and he says, oh, I don't know about that. He says, we're all 65 and 70 and none of us drive four-wheelers. <laughs> now, one of the things as well that's hard when we talk about secular culture is that it is elusive in that it constantly changes. And not only does it constantly change, it's changing faster than it ever used to before. We used to have the luxury as the church to take time to reflect, to do multi-year studies, and then to respond. Those days are gone. The rate of change that we see in the world, and it's very easy, I think, to see it, has increased so much. So let me ask you this. I'm actually looking for some responses. What are some things in our world that is causing the culture of our church or province or, or nation or even the world to change? What are some of the forces that you see that are driving cultural change right now? The Syrian refugee crisis. Refugee crisis, yeah, and just world geopolitical movements, you know, in general, right? Social media. Social media, technology. Technology is a huge driver uh, of change in a lot of different areas. Everything from communication to technology. I was listening this morning about the, um, the uh, protest that's going on in Montreal with taxi drivers because Uber is going to be allowed into the city. Uh, if you want to see an industry that's being turned on its head that has no way of figuring out how it's going to survive a uh, cultural shift. Any other changes? The economic situation so that people are going out west and then coming back and then going out and then coming back? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Migration patterns driven by economics and the price of oil goes up and down. I mean, all these things change. I, I pastored in Newfoundland for seven years, and, and while I was there, it was kind of price of oil was still going up. I mean, there's a culture that has been shaped by poverty for so many years after the collapse of the cod fishery and a number of other economic factors, and then all of a sudden, uh, to have a kind of a heyday in the last 10 or 15 years with the development and discovery of oil and hydroelectric and all that kind of thing, and then seeing a crash. Economics will, will drive us uh, and drive change in our culture. Culture changes over time. <coughs> now, misery loves company. <laughs> so the good news is that the church is not alone in our struggle to try to keep up with the change. There are so many industries, businesses, programs, community, government, I mean, all these different things that struggle the same way that we do. Working now at Acadia Divinity College, at a seminary, this is on our minds all the time. 
because, well, when I went to school not that many years ago, and probably even more pronounced before that, the, the model for people entering into ministry was that you would feel a call to ministry, be affirmed by your church, then you would move to Wolfville, you'd spend three years, get your MDiv, you would candidate, and you would go out and, and, and pastor a church. That's an over overgeneralization, of course, but, but now that is not the case. Now the case is people are actively engaged in ministry, churches are just desperate, looking for quality, Christ-centered, committed leaders to lead their church. And the idea of giving up three years of that time in life to come and study full-time in Wolfville is just out the window. And so even as a seminary, we struggle with how do we prepare Christian leaders for the next generation. You can see this across business. You can see this across education. You know, there, there's some uh, businesses and industries out there that just have not responded well. How many people still have a late return Blockbuster VHS sitting at home? <laughs> right? Like, where are you going to send that? Blockbuster seeing video rental. Everyone will always still want to watch videos. The thought that a video rental store business would be completely gone in a matter of three to five years was unheard of. And along comes Netflix, who not only put Blockbuster out by streaming content online, but we're going to see the death of satellites and traditional cable companies within the next two to five years as places like Netflix are creating their own content. Technology shifted that industry so massively. But some changed really, really well. My favorite example is Brinks, right? So everyone knows what Brinks is, and then move the money, and every time you walk by them, you're just a little cautious of the... You know. <laughs> Brinks started out in the era of horse and buggy. When they started out, there was two horses driving a large armored carriage, as heavily armored as it possibly could be. And then the rise of the automobile came. Now part of the industry, the horse and buggy maker, well maybe not the horse maker, but the buggy makers, <laughs> are pretty much extinct. And Brinks had an opportunity. It was fueled actually by a fire in Boston, which destroyed a lot of its competitors, but it was able to step in and, and buy some of these new automobiles. And all of a sudden, one car could do the job of 12 teams of horses and be more secure because it could be more weight. And they were able to change with the advance of technology. The world that we live in is changing at such a rate and such a pace that we have to, as a church, continually change to be able to speak into it. And that scares us. And it confuses us because the ways that we've done it before don't seem to work. A pastor in a local church continually trying to catch their breath between trying this and that and the next. Afraid of failing as a church? If we start this ministry and nobody comes, nothing happens, then what? But I want to encourage you to say that you're not alone. This is not a problem that's necessarily unique to the church, although I think it is unique to us in some ways, which we'll get to. It's not a rural problem, it's not an urban problem. It's something that affects us all. So relating is hard. Why is it so hard for us now, and, and maybe throughout history as well, to relate to the culture that's around us? Well, I think at the heart of it is this. I think that we get confused and we get nervous about what in the culture of the church is biblical, is mandated by God, and what is just cultural. Because the biblical stuff, that, that can't change. The things that Christ has commanded us to do, the way that he's called us to be, the beliefs, the behaviors, the systems that are God-ordained must remain, lest we lose the gospel itself. However, <laughs> There's a whole bunch of other stuff that comes along with that in our churches and our church communities that are just cultural. That somewhere along the ways we have gathered together, have packaged it together with the way that we do church, the way that we live our lives. And not only do I believe that that can change, 
I firmly believe it has to change. And we, we do this out of firm, deep belief and devotion to God. Right? Like, how many people here today come from a church that's completely heretical and doesn't love Jesus? <laughs> right? Or how many people here, you know, like, no, I mean, we're all here, we would all say in our churches, no, we desire to follow Christ, to do what he wants us to do. We're not trying to subvert the gospel, we're not trying to sell out to, and I'm using that in the cultural sense and not the biblical sense from the video from yesterday, um, to, to sell out to culture, to water it down. No, we're trying to be biblical, we're trying to, to be God-honoring. But we just have a hard time taking the scalpel and performing the self-surgery on the local body of Christ to figure out what's vital organs and what's an appendix. So some examples of this. I, I, I worry about going down this too far because we can, our minds will go certain ways. But <laughs> let, let's pick on the worship boards because they're basically dead and we, those are all, that's finished, so it's safe to touch, right? Um, <laughs> don't waste yourself. Um, God demands us to worship. He expects it of it. It's commanded in Scripture. It's modeled in Scripture. If we don't do it, the, cro the, the rocks and the trees and the grounds will do it on our behalf and then shame on us. However, well, let me, let me ask you this question. This is a question I asked in my, my previous church, to which all the deacons just kind of put their heads down on the table. Um, <laughs> can somebody tell me this? What is God's preferred key for singing? I think it's C, but other people quite assure me that it is G. Maybe that's too hard of a question. Maybe that's too hard of a question. So, what is what is God's preferred make of guitar? Is he more of a Taylor kind of kind of God, or or is he more of a Martin? You know, a big dreadnought D forty five, D bassy. I think he's more of that, but. Okay, maybe that's too hard. So does God prefer the piano or the guitar? Oh, neither, you say. Of course he prefers the organ. <laughs> he has no preference. At least not that we know of. The only real indication of instrumentation that pleases God is all of them. Get the cymbal, get the lyre, get the harp. Because everything you have is not enough to fully reflect who I am as God. Use it all. And then when you're done, sing a new song. <laughs> Make a new instrument. Because <laughs> that's the kind of God that we serve. Well, okay, so, but we have to choose which key to sing in. So what, I mean, I mean, practical boots on the ground. What key do we choose? Well, my... One that the most people can sing in. Well, that's a novel <laughs> idea. Let's look around the room and say, hey, everybody, let's try a few different keys. This one seems to be the best. Well, what style of music should we do? Well, I would say whichever one makes it easier for us to worship God and doesn't get in the way of that experience, that'd be great. Well, what songs we should say? Oh, I don't know, the best ones that reveal the mysteries of God and allow us to praise and worship Him and enter fully into an experience with Him. I think that's a pretty good measuring stick. But, but, <laughs> the hard part is knowing what's going to accomplish that in your culture. You say, well, I know that very well. I've been doing it for 125 years in my church. I've been there for most of them. And I know these songs resonate and work very well. Thank you very much. I mean, there's other things that, that we can talk about that, that, that are cultural. When I grew up, Sunday best. Sunday best. Sunday best didn't refer to just the clothes that I wore, but... <coughs> It meant leaving part of myself at home because that doesn't belong in church the way that I talk and walk and behave for the rest of the days. Put on your Sunday best. But growing up, it was, it was ingrained in me that if there was a certain dress that I was supposed to... Uh, not a dress. Um, <laughs> I have a story about that, but that's for another time. Uh, but, but, but what kind of clothes are I supposed to wear? I had an outfit that was set aside that was just for Sunday, just for God alone. And I was 12 years old, and I was living in Goshen, Nova Scotia. I was traveling an hour each way on the bus from Goshen to Sherbrooke to go to school. 
And in Haddam Yates, Geisman County, God's most beloved and forgotten county in Nova Scotia. Um, and, and so we'd have lots of time to talk on the bus with all the people. I was the first one on the bus, last one off. I had friends, uh, her name was Sean, and she lived down uh, the road from us. She used to get on about five minutes after. We would talk and talk and talk. She didn't come to church. Her family didn't talk to church most of the time. Uh, they were out water skiing and all that kind of fun stuff on a Sunday morning. We drove by and I just longed and yearned and wondered if I could possibly be adopted into that family. And, uh, and so we would talk to church and she would ask and that kind of stuff. And then one time, it blew my mind, Shauna asked me, well, if I came to church, what should I wear? Because Shauna's family, they were just relaxed. Right? Like, e even at that, and that was kind of like the late 80s, even then, her father, in the business that he was in, dressed more casually. And she was very concerned that she would come and just not fit in because of the way that she dressed. And I said, oh, well, my sisters all wear, like, blouses and dresses and that kind of stuff, and if you had something like that, that'd be fine. I didn't realize that she probably didn't own any clothes like that. My older sister heard me from the seat behind me, leaned over and cracked me upside the head. <laughs> and she said, Shauna, Shauna, you can wear whatever you want. And you tell me what you're wearing, and I'll wear the same thing. Yeah. And Shauna said, yeah. all right. <laughs> God moved 15 years ago, it still is. Um, she came to church, and her whole family came to church, and they all, more importantly, came to Christ. Amen. But because of my narrow understanding of what the culture of my church should be, because I didn't understand that people outside the church, they don't feel that need to dress and conform, Especially if you're coming to a place that's meant for people who are sick, who need a doctor, not for the people who are already perfect. Almost missed her. Almost missed her entire family. Not everything in our church is sacred. Not everything in the culture around us is profane. God is ahead and it moves everywhere. Where can we go on the earth where God is not already there? What can stop him? What can contain him? Nothing. We have to get better at looking at a church and asking the hard question, this part of our church, this thing that we do, gold offering plates, ushers, deacons, pews, organs, worship, what is of God and what's got to change? The other thing I think it makes hard for us to relate time -wise, okay, is that we stop changing. And this, this part of the discussion goes way above my pay grade, my knowledge level. And so the best I can do is tell you is somewhat some very intelligent people like Dr. Bob Wilson have said to me before, and that is, as a church, especially in North America, we have a tendency to institutionalize the last moving of the Holy Spirit and ride that horse until it goes no more. That's second part's mine. Um, <laughs> what happens is we find something that works. And it works so well and it spreads and we copy it and we multiply it and we tweak it and we adjust it. And we keep doing it so long, but dare I say the Holy Spirit may have moved on. And culture certainly has. Now again, I, I'll probably upset some people here. Is Karen and Jansen in the room? No? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Sunday school was invented in Britain. There were scores of children who were uneducated, working in factories or, or having to stay in, in, uh, in prison with their parents during the week, and they were only available for weekend. They couldn't afford to go to school. And so the church saw a need of saying, we can provide school for them for free. We can teach them to read, to be literate, to understand using the Bible. And as we do that, they'll know Christ. And it was hugely successful. And it was a movement that swept not only England, but really the entire world. And it was highly effective. I mean, I, people in my church tell me stories about having the bus and driving around town and picking them up. I mean, when I was in St. John's, it wasn't that long ago. It was people my age telling me about the good old days when they remembered that happening. And yet, while we were there ministering at Western Baptist Church, we had to make the hard decision of saying, this isn't working anymore. I mean, God bless all seven of us that come. But there's a whole lot more than the seven of us that need Jesus. 
And so we had to sacrifice something that was good for something that was better. And it's funny to say that because that doesn't sound like a sacrifice, giving up something that's good for something that's better. That's not the definition of sacrifice, but man, it felt like it. And we run the danger when we do that to say, or to at least give the appearance of saying, that program, that thing that we were doing, we don't value it anymore. Sometimes that's how it's felt or interpreted from other people. Which I don't think, at least I, for me, I guess I can't speak for everybody who has tried to lead congregational change or make decisions like that, that's not what it's about. Rather, it's a celebration of how fantastic did God use this method or model or, or thing over the years to reach people for him. And now as a new generation is here, it is time for us to find a new way and a new path. The church has a long history. One of the strengths of Christianity is the way that our faith can be applied to any and all cultures. I mean, you can find lots of examples in the Bible. You don't have to look any further than Jesus himself or Paul to be able to walk into a new culture and say, let me tell you about Christ. You can look at St. Patrick or, you know, any of the early missionaries throughout any part of the history. I mean, I can't even stop to pick them up. But they all went, I mean, St. Patrick went and said, oh, look, a clover. Let me tell you about Christ and the Holy Spirit and the God and the Trinity. Over and over and over again, we've been able to go into cultures, the whole missions movement, to be able to go to other places and people and lands and make the, show that the gospel is relevant and powerful to them. And many of our churches, I feel, are just kind of at a point right now where we have stopped changing. But I think a lot of our churches are ready for what's next. Another reason why I think it's difficult for us to relate to the community is because we expect the community to bridge the gap. The way that we organize our church and some of the mentality that we have around it really has been ingrained in us and taught in a method where there were still Christians out there who just stopped coming to church. It was still kind of a Christian society. But for the most part, I want to tell you today that that time is gone. When we were in Newfoundland, my wife Sarah taught at an inner city school in St. John's. Now, inner city in Newfoundland just means they don't say please and thank you. Um, but but it, it, it was a rough school. It was in the middle of a, of a low-income housing district. And, I mean, she had kids in grade six who were bringing uh, their three and four siblings and packing their lunches in the morning because dad's gone and mom's not much help. And even in a place like Newfoundland, which only until about 15 years ago had segregated denominational school systems, even in that short time, those kids in her class had no concept of church. Never been to, their parents had never been to, maybe their grandparents. And that's the world that we're, we're living in. The idea of saying, let's just do what we're doing better. Let's make it easy for people to come in to the church to connect and be here, and they'll come I think for the most part is over. Now I'm not saying that our churches shouldn't be a place where people can come and we need to pay particular attention to our churches and the way that is designed and the run and what we do to make sure that there is no barrier. But at the same point we have to stop relying on the community or stop believing that the community are the ones that has to take the step to bridge the gap of culture, to make themselves uncomfortable, to take the initiative to come find us so we can tell them the good news of Christ. We're called to be ambassadors for Christ. And the last time I checked, one of the main purposes of an ambassador is to go into the other culture, into the other country, and represent Christ. The onus is on us to make the effort. And yet we act as if God stops working at the doors of our church. That he's not already actively out there, drawing people to him in ways that we can't even understand. And while it's important for us to show hospitality 
to people when they walk through the doors of our church, if hospitality stops there, we tell people a very important and sad and loud thing is that we only value you when you're in the doors of the church. <clears throat> My wife Sarah and I stayed up to 1 o'clock in the morning last night talking about this. Anna's cost me more sleep than I got ever imagine she would have. <laughs> you know, we were talking about just the idea of, well, how do we go? How do we, you know, I can't be best friends with everybody in the church. How do we show hospitality? How do we connect to people? And we start talking about our own circumstance because we're just have moved into uh, and started attending Kentville Baptist just over a year ago, and you know it's been kind of a very refreshing experience, kind of being on the other end of you know joining a church family and not really having anybody know who you are. And um, you know we just kind of talked about the the interactions that we have with people, the people that we feel closest to in the church, even though we might not hang out with them very much or do things with them, it's because of our interactions outside of church. I mean, when we're there, lots of people say hello in the chit-chat, how you doing, good to see you, that's great. But it's the guy who, actually even before we went to the church, struck up a conversation with us at Tim Hortons to say hello and talk to my kids. And then a week later, we happened to show up in their church. It's the other parents whose kids play on the same soccer team, who during the summer months, we get to sit and take pictures and watch our children kick a ball back and forth. And the conversations we had there have been so much more powerful and real and connecting and hospitable, even though we sit next to each other at church every day and, and talk all the time, too. <clears throat> real hospitality has to start outside of the church walls. And it has to continue outside of the church walls. One of the reasons, the reason why we find it hard to connect is because we're not really different. We like to think we are, but we're not. For the most part, our language is pretty much the same. We do have some culturally um, select language that we use. And although the, I love the video that you showed the other day, Steve, and while I'm all for making sure that we're in conversation with people, we need to be careful of using some of that language, though. It's, it's not all bad. It's, we're, you know, we're not saying never use the word grace or atonement. But just explain it. I mean, have you ever picked up a new hobby or played a new board game or a new sport where you had to learn the terminology because it was important to do so? You didn't stop playing that sport because you didn't understand all the words. It may have been a little bit uncomfortable and maybe you wish, gee, I really wish somebody would tell me what you know, this thing is, they keep telling me to do, but I have no idea what it is. But we just have to be careful to make sure that we explain. And it could be, and that can be really challenging sometimes. Sometimes just in the service, you may not have time to stop and talk about, okay, what does the word redemption really mean? Like, you know, and if you don't have the time, then I would probably say, don't use it at that point. <laughs> and don't think because you just preached one sermon on it 15 years ago that everybody understands. <laughs> Although, maybe everybody was there, but that's a whole other thing. We use the same technology, we dress relatively the same, we have a lot of the same behaviors. We don't stop being Canadians when we go and we still bump into people and apologize. Oh, I'm sorry, you bumped into me, I'm sorry. I mean, that kind of stuff doesn't change. And so we expect the culture out there to be radically different. And it's most of the time it's not. But it should be. And for some reason I just feel like some of the things that are most important where we should be different from the secular culture, we're not. Our attitudes, our beliefs, our actions, our motivations are, should be radically different. Uh, and let's pick on uh, the current refugee crisis and the amazing work that's being done by churches and communities across the land of Canada and beyond to, to help people in desperate need. Fantastic thing. But why do we do them? 
I mean, you can look at some communities, and there's lots of examples of this, where some churches in the community are sponsoring a family, and there's a, you know, maybe a community group made out of the Lions Club or Rotary and, you know, Concerned Citizens and the, the local MLA, and they're doing the exact same work. And on one hand, on one blush, you might look at that and say, well, it looks the same between the two groups. Maybe the cultures aren't all that different. But underneath that, for us as the church at least, should be a significant difference as to why we're doing it. I mean, yes, we're doing it because people need help. It's the right thing to do. But more than that, because we believe that there's a God who says we are all equal and who commands us to care for the stranger. Who gave us his son, who laid down his life so that we who are refugees from a relationship from God, who were strangers in a land far from him, could find a home, could find peace. And if that has been done for us, how much more should we do that for others? Completely different in, in a lot of ways as to why we do it. And it makes it hard for us to really unpack that. And, and there are large differences. The, the culture outside of us is highly individualistic. It's all about me, it's all about what can I do, what can I get. Um, and the church shouldn't be. The church should be more communal. It should be about us and we, our family in Christ. It should have deep relationships, sharing lives with each other. Just sometimes it's, we don't live up to that ideal. You know, our culture is about leader and power and I don't even know what's going on with the states right now with the election, but we'll just leave that. <laughs> but the church should be about serving the meek, the broken, the humble. The people outside of our church, the people in our communities know how we, the church, should be. I mean, I dare you, go ask anybody on the street, tell, ask them, tell me what a church should be. In an ideal world, what, what should a church be like? And they'll probably say things like, loving, accepting, caring. And then if you're really brave, ask them what the church actually is. The problem we have a hard time relating is because we're not different enough and we come across as inauthentic at best, probably hypocritical at worst. And I'm not saying that we all have to have it all figured out and be perfect before we can engage culture, but we have to have an attitude at least of this is the direction I'm trying to get to. So how do we, even though it's hard, we have to do it anyway. How do we actually reach out to culture? Um, there are too many cultures, it changes all the time. There's no way for me to tell you how to do this. Moving on. No. Um, there's, there's, I hate saying four easy steps. Uh, but there's, there's a, a couple of basic principles, quite honestly, um, just to share with you. And we don't have a whole lot of time to unpack them. But step number one, and I think it's probably the hardest step and the biggest step and the step where most of our churches are stuck at is that you actually have to want to. And I mean, really want to. We have lots of reasons why we don't. Because our churches are perfectly designed to reach the people we have reached. And they're all 70. And they're all in the church. If we want to reach new people, we have to try new methods. You know, the, the quote that's wrongly attributed to Albert Einstein of the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results applies to our culture. Some of us worry about not being faithful. We might look at passages like John 17, 14. You know, we, we summarize it of be in the world but not of it. Keep yourself away from, just be different from the world. I'd love to walk through that today. If you take the time to look through it, you'll see that that's not a call for the church to be separate. 
It's a call for the church to engage. As I am in the world, Jesus says, so you be in the world too. Even though we're ambassadors, <coughs> aliens. So it's not a matter about being faithful, especially if like we talked about before about being careful with that surgery of finding what's a vital organ and what's not. Some of us think that our culture just isn't wrong, and so we shouldn't bother changing it. I uh, was talking to a deacon of a particular church, and uh, there was a, a, a conversation that had happened at a deacon's meeting, and the comment was made saying, oh, it was more of an, uh, I guess a damning accusation of saying, if Jesus Christ lived and walked in this community, he wouldn't be welcome in this church. Middle Eastern, single, unemployed. He wouldn't fit here. To which another deacon replied and said, no, he wouldn't. But that's okay. There's a church down the street where he'd feel very comfortable. <laughs> we're, we just don't operate like that. That's just not the kind of people that we have here, and, and that's all right. <laughs> that, that, was, that was my original reply, and I still can't come up with anything better. Um, <laughs> the excuse of the church down the street will handle it is not a good excuse. We don't get to say, well, we don't want any of those kinds of people. Let's start a, a church downtown for people like that. Or let's plant a, a different kind of church. Or, hey, maybe what they need is a second service. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm all for uh, new and innovative ways of worship and community and church and, 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 and that kind of thing, but not when it's a way for us to dodge our responsibilities. Sometimes we don't want to change because we don't think because sometimes it's only us that wants to change. In some ways I'm preaching to the choir here because I assume that you being here is some sort of indication that you want to engage and want to learn our culture. It might be the people back home that we have to convince. And although we can go and take that step as individuals ourselves and try to bring change and congregational change, it's hard. Because we're called as a community to do that. Sometimes we're simply too busy. We'd like to change. But oh, the thought of adding another, you know, board, we're gonna need a, you know, at least a board and moderator, and we'll have to have a vote on that for the church. And we probably can't start anything new until the next annual general business meeting. And then we have to find volunteers to staff and take minutes and then make sure that we present our reports back in time. That just that seems like a lot of work. Sometimes we have to sacrifice. Sometimes we have to shut things down to free ourselves and our people to have the time and the space to get out of the church and go share Christ. Sometimes we're just scared about wanting to change. C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity that the way to know if you're living by faith is that you are doing for God. What you're doing for God scares you. And if it doesn't, he said, there is no faith involved. So get comfortable being scared. Because if what you're doing is not driving you to your knees, you're not trying hard enough. Or maybe you're trying the wrong thing. There's lots of reasons why sometimes we want to, but this process of, of actually wanting to change is massive. The last three and then we'll be done. We have to learn. We have to understand. You might say, well, you know what? There's a lot of different uh, communities and subcultures in our, in our community. Uh, we really want to reach out to the four-wheeling uh, kind of outdoor kind of community in our church. That's what we want to do. So you get past want to. The next step is not dream up a, you know, a ministry that will reach them. The next step is learn about them. Walt Mueller, who's a really great thinker, he's the director of the Center for Parent and Youth Understanding uh, down in the States. He's lectured uh, here. We've had him in Atlanta, Canada. And, and um, one of the things that he taught uh, once in the class I was at that always stuck with me is how embarrassed he was 
uh, when he goes to the grocery store because he buys all the teen magazines. Right? And Walt's like, you know, I don't want to say how old he is, but he's older than me. And his children are long grown up, and there's no reason for him to be buying those magazines. And people give him funny looks. But he buys them not because he enjoys reading them, but because he wants to learn, continue to learn about the youth he's trying to reach. He wants to be reading what they're reading with a critical eye and to be bring Christ into it. Some of that, some cultures you can do that. Some cultures you can read and understand. And a lot of them, especially with the technology and online, there's subgroups and places where you can go and find where they're organizing. And, but honestly, the best way is just be. Be with them. Spend time. That is the best way. Show up, keep your mouth shut. And learn. Because out of that will become a great understanding of not only what motivates these people, it allows you to build relationships for them, and then when that God-given time comes, that there's an identified need that you can meet and an opportunity to minister to, you're already there. You're not parachuting in. You're not somebody called the pastor. You're right there. When I was doing student ministry in Hansport, I was there with uh, Todd Coldwell, who was the youth pastor. Todd was fantastic at this. He would just go hang out downtown in Hansport. And he happened to be there one day in the basketball courts, where a group of pretty rough guys were, were playing, and a couple of the friends walked by, a guy and a girl, they were on a date. Well, the friends thought this was fantastic, and so they started giving them the gears. They were all good friends, right? It was very whatever. It, but to the older couple who were out for a shuffle across the street, it sounded like bullying and harassment. And so when that was reported to the village council, and the mayor decided that action needed to be taken, mostly to turn off the lights and lock the basketball court at night. Todd was able to go to the community and say, um, actually I was there. That's not really what happened. And he was able to step into that community and all of a sudden, some of those people that were there built a relationship and a trust for Todd. And six months later, the problem we were dealing with was whether or not we should have an ashtray inside of the church because we needed smoke break at youth group then. <laughs> It was the best problem we ever had. We need to engage, not engage as again, come to us and deal with this. I mean, in Newfoundland, we had uh, one of the most successful uh, VBSs in the entire city. We could only hold about 120 people because of the size of our building and it would sell out as soon as we'd open up. Or we'd sell, we didn't have charge admission. Oh, great idea. Uh, the registration would be full. And then they went all out. I've never seen a VBS done better. We one guy climbed to the rafters of a church and made a tent out of 10, or not 10,000, but 2,000 balloons. Right? A big carnival tent. But when we looked at the numbers, we realized that 90% of the kids who were coming from outside of our church, most of them were already churched. And so we said, well, we need to close this down. And so we stopped that VBS and we started sending all of our volunteers to a, uh, a community center, in a low income housing center. And said, look, we've got like 35 volunteers. Can you use them? I said, sure, we're doing Meals on Wheels and we're gonna do some bingo and you know, can, yeah, so that our, one of our deacons up front calling the bingo numbers, right? It was just whiplash. <laughs> but the next year they said, they said to us, we said, hey, we have 30 uh, volunteers again this week because uh, it was our March break, so we almost did it. Uh, can you use them? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we could use them. But man, uh, we've got no programming in the mornings. Hey, didn't you guys used to do a Bible club? Can you come and do that here? Okay. So three of us, four of us would go over, and we'd get like 10 kids, and none of them had ever heard about Jesus before. Lots of stories you can tell about that when we don't have time. The last part after you begin to engage is persevere, because it doesn't change. Don't give it six months. Don't give it a year. When Jesus called and said to tell, to toss and said, love your neighbor, he didn't give a timeline. He didn't put conditions on it. Growing up in my church, we had uh, one pastor who I remember who at first started off the ministry really well. He was the type of guy who if you were out chopping wood, he'd stop and help you chop wood. And he would do that and build that relationship until it became apparent to him that you probably wouldn't come to the church. And then that relationship would be dropped cold. And after doing that five or six times in the community, the word got around. And that was basically the end of his outreach and ministry. We're called to love our neighbors, to be there, 
to serve no matter what, for however long. So in closing, just let me say this. We engage culture. And cultural relevance isn't the goal. It isn't to be cool. It's a tool to communicate the gospel. And I urge you and myself and all of our churches to do this, to remove all obstacles at all times, at all costs, for the sake of Christ. Thank you.